Welcome to the Pesky Report, a podcast for Red Sox fans. Welcome back to the fifth episode of the Men of Tomorrow interviews, um, series of interviews that we're running throughout the off season with different uh, various minor league players in the Red Sox organization. Um, I'm Ed Hand, and I am joined today by Brandon Brewer. How are you doing, Brandon? Good, man. It's been a while since we've been on together. I'm excited to get on here and uh, talk a little baseball with you. Yeah, I am too. And uh, today uh, we are joined by um, a catcher for the uh, last year, the Portland Sea Dogs. He's been with the organization for a few years now. Eli Marrero. This is apparently uh, this is his first um, his first podcast ever. So we get the uh, the honor of uh, of matriculating him into the uh, the podcast world. Uh, so I'm just gonna gonna let him into the room now. Hey, Eli, how you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? How you guys doing? Good, good. Thanks for being on here with us, man. It's uh, it's an honor to talk to you and an honor to meet you. No, it's an honor to be here. Thank you guys for having me on. Yeah, we're uh, we're super excited, and um, you know, part of part of the appeal of doing these episodes for me here that you could listen to them at any point, and uh, it's not based on what happened last week. Uh, you're finding out about players, but we're going to talk about something that happened last night, um, <laughs> and that is the no hitter in the World Series that um, Christian Vasquez uh, was the catcher for. It was a multi team uh, effort, a few different pitchers, uh, and you've got a little bit of experience catching. Uh, catching a no hitter this year as well. Yeah, I did. I got the opportunity to catch a no hitter with uh, Brian Bayo, who is a heck of a ball player. Um, that was actually my second one. I actually caught a team no hitter as well in, Green, uh, in Greenville the year before, which I had no idea about, which is the craziest thing. You know, we went you had no, the- I- no idea. Uh, I remember Wu Yellen was a starting pitcher. Um, and I think we got to like the first four innings and I had no idea that I even had a no hitter. And then when the game ended in the ninth, when uh, Wallace got that last ground ball, hit the cost, I see everybody running out onto the field. I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, <laughs> what, what the heck is going on guys? And they're like, Oh yeah. Look at the scoreboard. I'm like, Oh my God. I just, I just, <laughs> it's just called a no hitter. I had no idea, but, um, uh, it was cool. It's, it's an amazing experience when you and the, uh, and the pitcher's locked in, especially when you get to catch a guy like Brian Bayo, who just has some nasty stuff, let me tell you. Nasty stuff. Um, it's very special. You know, you, you kind of you come up with a game plan, and then as the game goes on, you use your eyes to play the game, and you go off of each other. It's just more of like more of a trusting uh, with you and the pitcher. But it's hard to explain because you're so locked in in the moment, but you also know what's going on, but you don't want to say anything. You don't want to do anything else because you don't want to break that that. Uh, what's going on there, but it's, it's awesome. Which, so you didn't even know it was happening with the first no hitter, which was multiple, it was multiple pitchers, but a full nine innings, right? Yeah. Full nine innings. And I had no idea. It it was the craziest thing. Did, did you feel more, did you feel the pressure for this? Cause I think it was a seven inning one that Bayo threw. Did you feel a lot of pressure on that one though? Cause you know, in the books, it's a no hitter is a no hitter. I don't, I don't care if it's, if it's nine different pitchers or one pitcher, it, no hitters a no hitter. Um, but do you feel more pressure when it was one person, but seven innings? I wouldn't say I felt pressure. I think, I, I think it really got to me when we got to the seventh inning and I, and I knew what was going on this time. And I was like, Oh man. I, I've been putting down the right numbers, but God forbid I put down the wrong one right now, man. <laughs> but uh, no, I just tr- trusted my gut with my pitcher, and and we just enjoyed the moment. And it was super cool to, to experience that with him, and, and I was happy for him in the moment. Now, we always hear about the guys avoiding the pitchers that are in the moment, and pr- throwing a no-hitter, throwing a perfect game, what have you. Do the guys also avoid the catcher in that situation? Um. Uh, Yes and no. I mean, I, I remember when Bale was, th- was throwing it, guys would come up to me and, and tell me what's going on. I'm like, yo, I'm just like, hey, leave me alone. I know. And, but, uh, <laughs> you try to do everything the same, you know. You got to treat it like if, if, if they had two, two or three hits, four or five hits. Can't change it, you know. So you still got to go over. I know in between innings we go over, all right, we got these three hitters coming up, and then we talk about it with the pitching coach. 
Um, you try not to change what, what you what you do throughout the year. Because then when you start to change routine, then it's kind of like, oh, why is he staying away from me? And then they start paying attention to little things rather than just going out there and staying in the flow they're in. That's a good point. Yeah. Did you find it um, when you when you started hitting, you know, come sixth inning or seventh inning, did you find you were a little uh, less focused? Um, no. I told you, I, I really, it didn't really kick in until like I got out there for the last three outs where it was like, oh man. Like this is the big thing now, and uh, but no, I didn't. I didn't feel really any pressure hitting or thinking about it. I mean, I, I knew when, if I got, I think I grounded out or something like that, and I was like, all right, no big deal. I got to get three outs. So I was like, <laughs> I didn't even usually. Usually when I hit, and I'm usually locked in, and I'll think about the at bat. But I kind of went to the dugout that time, put on my gear, and sprinted out. So. There was a lot of advancement for pitchers from Portland to uh, to Worcester and even beyond that. Um, I think I remember seeing the rotation at the beginning of the year was either in Worcester or Boston come the end of the season. It was with, um, you know, with obviously Bayo ended up in Boston, but there was um, Walter and Murphy, Victor Santos, like it's and um, Jay Groom who's no longer with the organization, but it seemed like everybody was uh, – you know, it was just really like you look at that rotation at the beginning of the year. It was just a who's who in the in the organization. What's what's it like for you catching talent like that? I mean, it, on paper, we probably had the best pitching staff ever to come out of the minor leagues. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, from top to bottom, from our first five starters to our relievers. I mean, when you get a staff like that, it's kind of you kind of everyone's their own character in a way. So you kind of just you let them do their thing. They're special already, you know. So all, all you can do really is is have a good game plan, build that trust and, and factor with them, and and just let them do their thing, you know. Because every guy's different. You can't treat everybody the same. So you, know, you some guys you just gotta let them run wild. Who um, what was your impression of Bayer when he got to the uh, when you when he got called up to the majors and he had that uh, that terrific month of September? Like, were you was he did he look like what you had seen in um, you know in Double A or did it look like he had taken a step up? Uh, he definitely looked like he took a step up as well. I mean, he got better over the years. I actually got to meet Bayo when he when we first picked him up. I think in 2018, I think we he had come from the DSL right to rookie yeah. ball. So I got to see him grow up through, through the, throughout the years and see what he's turned into. And when he made that MLB debut, and it, it was just super sick to watch. You know, having that guy in Double A and doing what he did, just destroy and go through hitters in Double A, Triple A level, and to see him do it in the big leagues, it was super sick, and I was super happy for him. What's something that you know fans might not know about him that you know uh, just from getting to catch him over the years? He's a uh, He's a fun individual in the clubhouse. Uh, he's always dancing, having a good time. Um, he's he's a great teammate, and I, I know you see him out there on the field. He's super serious and locked in. But when you when you get him like off to the side, not on the field pitching, and he is a character, and he is fun to be around. He's always laughing, smiling, and having a good time. Yeah, he definitely has a lot of swagger on the mound. Um, there's a lot of people call him, you know, compare him to Pedro Martinez. And that's, you know, seems kind of unfair to somebody that's literally just coming up now. But, you know, like I can definitely understand why people get excited about him. I mean, also. I, I can see it. I mean, he's got that it factor. He's got the attitude like Pedro did. If not, maybe better. You know, I really? know Pedro, Pedro may not want to hear that. I mean, but, but, you know, this is the new era of baseball. You know, guys are. Guys have a little bit more attitude than they did back in the day. You know, they like to show off a little bit, but that you can't change who you are. If that's who you are, you know, and he's a guy that goes out there and he backs it up every time. Yeah, and you can you can say that having grown up around baseball from Pedro's era too, because your uh, your dad was an MLB player, right? Yeah, yeah, he played uh, I think ten years uh, in Major League Baseball. I think it was not. I don't. I'm not. I don't really remember. I think it was maybe five or six with the Cardinals, and then the rest with a couple different teams. Yeah, he was. Um, he was. I, he was a teammate with uh, McGuire during the home run chase, right? Yeah. Yes, he was. That were you, were you at the stadium as a kid for that at, at all? I was. I would love. I like to say I. I do remember, but I was so small. My mom <laughs> said she took me out there on the field and everything, but I, I don't recall anything to be honest with you guys. I mean, 
I, I know there's a picture of me in the house somewhere that that has me there, but I don't remember any of that that craziness. But uh, whenever I talk to him about it and he explains it, and it was one of the craziest things in baseball that he got to witness, you know, and uh, that Mark McGuire uh, every day at the clubhouse he just talks hitting and uh, he just went about his business like a true professional. Were you um, awesome. were were you in the were you in the uh, like the dugout in the clubhouse a lot as a kid? Oh, I was. I got the opportunity to be there. I think my my best moment as a kid, and this is the only thing I remember, was I think either 2000, 2001, the Cardinals won the division. And um, I don't know if they still do this. They, they, they allow the families in for the, the champagne party and all that. But I got to witness that. I think I was like three years old. Oh, wow. You know, it's probably not healthy for a three-year-old to be <laughs> having beer poured on them. But, but luckily, I got to experience that. And that's the one thing I remember the most probably about that at a young age. I'm just imagining like a three-year-old with like uh, the goggles on. Yeah. Well, I didn't have any goggles. So man, maybe that's why my eyes are getting bad now because I was getting <laughs> a bunch of stuff in my eyes, but it was just cool. All my dad, I have a picture there. All my dad's shoulders just soaked and I'm in the car and I get home. My mom was just, Oh my God, you smell like, you smell like beer, this, this, but it was a, a great time. So did I can't you go imagine. Like, a, base? Oh, sorry. I can't imagine a, a police officer pulling you over that night. And, Sir, why does, why does your toddler smell like beer? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that would have been an interesting quote. I don't know how he would have got out of that one, but. Well, in St. Louis, I'm sure they would know. Yeah. Officer, you don't understand. We just clinched a playoff spot. <laughs> Um, oh, so you, so you must've grown up playing baseball then. Was it the only, was baseball the only sport that you played? Unfortunately? Yes. Um, I, I did get to do like a little martial arts as a kid, just like every kid does, you know, they do karate. I did a little bit of, uh, uh, jujitsu, but baseball is the only career and sport that I was super passionate about because I wanted to follow my, in my dad's footsteps. Um, so I didn't, I didn't play any of the sports. I put all my focus into baseball and all my time, um, but yeah. Were you always a catcher? So no. So that that's a funny story too. Uh, <laughs> I was I grew up being being a shortstop, right? But through coach pitch, um, starting little league. Then they put me in center field because I could run a little bit. And then one day I woke up at nine years old and I was like, he, I was like, Pops, man, hey, I want to catch. So I think he got I think he got really inspired and excited. He got me gear that same day. We went to the backyard. We started practicing, and and ever since then, uh, I've been catching. And then I played a little outfield, but ever since nine years old, I I started to love uh, the catching position. Yeah, you're. It's, it's funny. It's funny you say that you you could run a little bit. It looks like you can still run a little bit. Looking at uh, your stats before we came on here, and we noticed that you're a catcher that likes to steal some bags. Hey man, you can't be you can't be giving away my secrets on here, man. <laughs> pitchers, are, pitchers are gonna start picking off now. But um, but yeah, I mean, I take pride in any way I can help the team win. So I mean, I've always been able to run, and I, I was one of those Mill Ta Tasmanian Devil kids who just love to run around all crazy in the backyard. So I just kind of treat it like that when I'm on the bases, but a little bit smarter now. So. I mean, the timing certainly uh, certainly helps with that. But you gotta you gotta have wheels. I mean, you you were on the same team as uh, David Hamilton this year, who uh, broke the uh, the Portland Sea Dogs single season record. Was there uh, did you was there any competition with that at all? I, mean, I would tell I would tell David every day, man. I go, I think it was I think he had twenty, and I think I had about like five. I think, and I was like, hey, I'm gonna catch you, D D Ham. I'm gonna catch you. And then I think I got two more that day. And I was like, I told you I'm getting closer. And then he just started to run away with it, run away <laughs> with it. And I was like, ah, oh, man, that's well, you can have this one, man. But he is fast. Yeah. Like, it, he is he's, fast. Would, he, he's unbelievable. I would line up with him on the line and be like, all right, let's race right now. And I would get him the first three steps and he would just hit a second gear and he would just take off. You know, the crazy part, I've seen guys pitch out during the year. Literally, they would pitch out knowing he was going, and they still couldn't throw him out. It was the craziest. Wow. That's that's elite speed right there. The only guy that I ever saw do that is when my dad was coaching with the uh, Bakersfield. This was back with Cincinnati Reds. I don't know what year it was, um, but it was Billy Hamilton before he got called up to the big leagues. He was there, and I think it was high at the time. I think Bakersfield was, and he guys would pick off four or five times in a row. 
and then pitch. That's when they had the unlimited pickoffs. So guys would just pick off, pick off, pick off. They would pitch out to him, and he'd steal second, and the next pitch he would steal third. That's the only guy that I've seen ever do that until uh, until Hamilton. That's some that's some pretty high praise for Hamilton there because I mean actually they're both Hamiltons now that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonder if there's just something in that something in that name there. Yeah. But um, did you find that the the pick off the amount of pickoff throws and the bigger bases? Because I know they're talking about adding that at the big league level. Did you find that it made stealing easier? Uh, I mean, yes and no. I don't want to say yes, and I don't want to say no either. I mean, it it does kind of speed up the game a little bit, but I feel like it also takes away from the game a little bit as well. You know, this game is built on on strategy. I feel like as well, it's not just physical; it's also mental. So, I mean, when you got a fast guy on there, pitchers are told, all right, hold the ball, pick off, hold the ball, be quicker to the plate. And with the pickoffs, you got a guy, again, you got a guy like Hamilton, you pick off twice, you know he's going the next pitch. And so he's going to get he's gonna get out there, leap, 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 get out there, get out there, get out there, because you got to, if you don't pick him off, it's a balk anyway. So you just get that huge lead and get that kind of a running start. So it kind of makes it a little bit easier for, for the fast guys like that. Um, I feel like... For the bigger bases, I feel like that's going to be good for everybody. You know, especially you know, bang bang plays. Guys jump first baseman, jump in the air to catch a catch a ball from the infielders. You know, you get some collisions sometimes. I feel like that would avoid some injuries. So that that part of the game would be good. But I think for the bases, I mean, for the for the pickoffs, you got to leave it how it is. I mean, I know people want to see see uh, guys stealing bags and make the game more exciting. But when you got a guy back there like Yadier Molina, for example who's got a gun and you got a fast guy who's trying to be strategic when he steals bases. And when he gets that guy out, it's, it's something special. So I don't know. I don't know how guys will take it in the big leagues. I'm sure the base dealers are going to love it. You see a lot more runs put up on the board. As a, as a defensive catcher though, um, how do you feel with that? Just coming from having to, you know, having to be, these guys have these extra head starts and like, does it, has it affected like how, how you go about calling your game now? Oh uh, no, not really. I mean, you, you kind of gotta you gotta use strategy here as well. I mean, you probably pick off once and then save the second one. You just gotta vary your holds. Um, it doesn't really change the way I call the game, you know, because my main focus is still the pitcher to get this guy out, uh, get the guy out at the plate. Um, but I mean, as you just keep you just make sure you look at the runners and you keep you keep the uh, pitcher not in a in a rhythm. And you just each switch it up, and you can control the game. How much do you have to work on, like your pop time and stuff like that, knowing that guys are are stealing more frequently in today's baseball with the the newly implemented rules change and stuff like that? And you got thirty six percent of the guys last year. Is that something that you're trying to up every year, and you're working on that consistently? Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love to to throw guys out all the time? You know, I mean, I, I take a lot of pride in that. When, it, like I said, sure, however you I, should. Yeah, um, however, I can help the team win, and that's a big part. You know, controlling the controlling the running game. Um, I do. I would like to get that number up. I think I remember at the beginning of the season, I was like, I think I had like I was like six for six, and then we played, I think, New Hampshire, and they got three on me. Man, I was so mad. I was so mad, but um, I take a lot of pride in that. Um, throwing guys out is a fun thing. It's super fun when you just rip a bullet down the second base. You kind of look to the dugout and you got guys, you know, showing them the biceps, showing you the gun sign. You're like, oh, it's it's super cool. But uh, yeah, I mean, you just dip, you just you work on it in the off season, and then you go day by day about your work at the field. You know, you try not to think too much. You know, it's more of a reaction. You've done it, probably worked on that more than a million. Probably not gonna say a million, more than a thousand times. You know, before. And uh, before the game or during the season starts, so it's just going out there and trusting it. And then when the guys go, you just it's kind of just muscle memory, and you just go. So uh, going back in time a little bit, um, you were before you were drafted by the Red Sox. You were drafted by the Reds, if I'm uh, if I'm remembering this correctly. Yes. Um, what went into your decision to um, to head to college instead of immediately uh, signing? Uh, it just seemed like. At the time, I had just like every every kid coming out of high school. There's just I had a a number. I had spoke to my family, and we had a number in my head that I thought I was worth at the time. And 
and it just it's unfortunately it didn't work out at the time. Um, and then I just said, okay, you know, I'm going to make the decision to go to, uh, to college. And I ended up at Mississippi state. So it's like, when you got a chance to go to Mississippi state, I mean, you, there's no pressure for you to sign, you know? So I decided to talk to my family and I ended up, uh, going to college. What did you study? Uh, in Mississippi, I was doing business. Business. But um, and did you – you got drafted before um, – by the Red Sox before you finished the program there, right? Yes. I actually – I didn't – I only went there for for two years, and then I transferred out, out of Mississippi, and I went to St. Thomas University down here in Miami Gardens. Oh, gotcha. So you were just, like, closer to home. I'm sure there's more – bit more baseball there, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just just a change of scenery at the time. So while you were playing there at Mississippi State, of course, SEC baseball is is pretty big. And uh, I know you probably got to go around to some of the other SEC schools. Which fan base would you say was the absolute rowdiest SEC fan base that you played in front of? You guys probably know that answer already, but it's going to be, other than Mississippi State, it's going to be LSU. LSU, yeah. T- yeah. Texas A&M's up there as well. I didn't get to go to Texas A&M. They came to us. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they, they kind of spanked us that weekend, I remember. They had a great team that year, but um, LSU definitely. They have the craziest fans. And it feels like they're right on top of you because of the way that the, the stadium's, stadium is built. It's kind of sunken in, and then the backstop kind of comes over you a little bit. But I, that, that's what I would say. I'm sure other guys have different different opinions. I'm sure Arkansas is super nice too, but uh, LSU, it's LSU for me. LSU, wow, okay. Um, you – you played the Cape Cod League also during uh, during college, right? Yeah, I got to play there play there a little bit with the Born Braves. How'd you like fun, it there? It was fun. I, I had a good time. That was uh, my first time going to the Cape uh, in general. Um, I knew they had a lot of good food there, so that's what I really enjoyed uh, the lobster rolls and the lobster burgers. So I took advantage of that my first time going there. Oh man! So that was was that your first time up in New England entirely? Yeah, it was. Um, I enjoyed it. I, I stayed with this good, uh, great host family. Um, they took me in as one of their own, and it was awesome. That That is one of the cool things about the Cape League is you always hear about people that, that played there are always appreciative of those host families. That That's one of the coolest aspects of that entire league, I think. That's awesome in general. I mean, just for just for a random person to take you in, they yeah. kind of they kind of know who you are, but they kind of don't at the same time. And then just for them to welcome welcome them into your home or into their home, um, is just some is something cool. And then you build that bond and that relationship. Where if they have kids or if they don't have kids, you still build that bond and relationship. But especially if they have kids, you know they kind of look up to you and idolize you. You know, mm-hmm. and they and they watch everything you do. So it's kind of good. You're kind of that figure there for them, and you teach them your ways. And and yeah, it's special. And yeah, that's cool. one thing that I could never, uh, I could never get over how excited kids get about, uh, about meeting players. Like, um, and it doesn't matter if you're, you know, just like if you're in college or if you're a big leaguer, it's uh, really like, it's something about the uniform. I feel like just really get, kids get so excited about it. Yeah. I mean, you just got, you just got to go back and think about when you're a kid. I mean, you, even I used to get super excited meeting new people and, and, and I was around it for a long time like uh got the opportunity but like even even still to this day i get excited to meet meet guys who like even guys at the big league level now that we meet i get excited to talk to them and hang out with them you know, so i can only imagine a little kid you know who have all these dreams to be a professional baseball player and they, they see us pursuing that dream already or or trying to and and they, they want to be just like you and i think it's something cool and and awesome to just kind of be like an idol for them and and just have, and, and you have, have fun with it and enjoy it, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, besides uh, besides your dad, who was your favorite player growing up? Well, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that yeah. shots fired at pops, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you keep on. You're gonna edit that one out, right? <laughs> but uh, no, and other, other than him, I, I really like to watch uh, Yadier Molina. I think what. Uh, what he brought to the field and to the stadium all the time, and, and that energy was is something special to watch. It's gonna, it's gonna suck that he's not gonna you're not gonna see him next year at the Cardinals. End of know? an era for sure. Yeah, 
it, it's going to be tough, but you know, you're always going to remember all the all the good memories that he that he did and and was able to do in St. Louis. I thought was was awesome, and even still to this day, I pull up those highlights on YouTube and just watch him gun guys out. You know, and be like, all right, that's I got the same gun. You know, I like there to think go. I do at least. Yeah, we 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 do too as Red Sox fans. We like to think that that you're you're the next Yachty coming up. That would be fantastic to have. Um, what when you got the call from the Boston Red Sox that they were going to draft you? Like, what was your initial thought? You know, of course, you're you're not the first member of your family to even be drafted by the Red Sox. So that's uh, I'm sure that you had some uh, some other thoughts and emotions going through it as well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say this before we keep going. Everyone, everyone gets confused, man. Me, 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 and Devin are not related. You're not. Not at all. Everyone always says that that we are not related at all. I never got to meet him. I haven't never got to meet him. Um, hopefully, we could. I mean, after everyone always talks about us being family, we might as well meet one of these days, right? I mean, and finally see each other face to face. But I know him as a ball player. I know he's a he's a heck of a ball player. Um, but we're not related. <laughs> that, that's that is funny. Wild, uh, that's, On, you know, it, it's not often that baseball reference is wrong, right? Yeah. And that's where I got my information. On your dad's baseball reference page, it has a relative of Devin Marrero. Hey, maybe I'm missing something here. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll take your word for it. You're definitely closer to the uh, to the source than Baseball Reference, apparently. So. So when you got the call from the Boston Red Sox after your experience in the Cape League, how did you feel with that? So I, I played in the Cape League, I think, in 2016. And then I got drafted in 2018. But just being around the game of baseball and, and seeing how those Red, those Red Sox fans are out there, um, it was exciting for me to um to be picked up by the red sox uh it's a crazy story by the way because uh my grandpa is a i hate to say this sorry guys but he was a full-time yankees fan man so when i got drafted by by the red sox um i, I know that kind of hurt him a little bit <laughs> but um i was happy just to be a part of this uh this organization and it's been special so far that was your grandfather did he also play um a long long time ago he he's uh he used to play in cuba but uh, out here, I don't, I don't think he played at all uh, outside of that. Okay. You played for Lowell before uh, that they stopped being uh, a team. That was my – if you grew up around here, um, around Boston, Lowell was the absolute most fun games to go to for a kid because um, they just had all of this uh, all of this stuff there. Oh, I, uh, if you're watching the video version of this, Penny just uh, – <laughs> just kind of crawled up uh we're in the podcast that's awesome yeah she's deciding to uh to make her presence known um this seems usually she just barks so this is this is kind of a nice welcome surprise but um yeah how was how was playing in lowell how'd you like it there uh it was awesome i enjoyed it there. that was my i think uh i played rookie ball the year i got drafted and then i got the opportunity to go up there in 2018 at the end and it was awesome i enjoyed the heck out of it thought lowell massachusetts was awesome and especially the setup that we had they they had us right next to the field, I think at UMass dorms or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the UMass Lowell dorms there. And uh, it was nice. I enjoyed it a lot. I know on our off days, we would shoot down to Fenway and catch a couple games if they were playing at home. So that was a cool part of it. That was a pretty that, decent decent season to go and catch some games at Fenway. That year, yeah. Yeah, it was. They, they, they were pretty decent. Decent yeah, squad in 2018. They were good. <laughs> okay. Did okay. Only the best record in... In franchise history <laughs> was that was that exciting being part of the organization you like did you feel a connection to the team uh as they were going through that run yeah i mean you know as an organization you're always pushing for the big league team or at every level to do well um i'm sure those guys had a had a different feeling than we did you know we're just kind of watching from the sidelines but i'm sure that they felt everybody rooting for them and it was awesome to just be a part of the be a part of that organization and watch them do what they did yeah, no, 2018, man. Like, um, moving moving forward in your career, you were in uh, Greenville last year. You were in Portland Midland uh, this year. Have you really? Have you felt like the competition has gotten that much better with each level? Yeah, I mean, you make when you make that jump to uh, from every level. 
I mean, from when I started in rookie ball to now, you see guys developing the – like, again, I played with Brian Bayo in rookie ball. And then you look at him over the years from when he went to Greenville the year after and then Greenville again and then Portland. And then you see him now in the big leagues. You just see all those guys develop and develop and get better. And those are the guys that you're facing. And all the, the competition does get better. You know, guys are striving for one goal, and, and that's to make it to the big leagues. Um, but I guess all you can do is is take it day by day and, and just enjoy the moment, which is the most important thing. You know, not everybody enjoys the moment of competition, and that's what makes this fun. You know, you work so hard for a goal and a dream, but you can't lose sight of of having fun as well because I you know, used to be a, little, a kid at Little League, and you just, you know, you're rooting for your teammates yelling and screaming, you know, and you're doing the same, the same game now. You're just adults. That's, I mean, that really does sum it up, too. I think, um, you know, I know, I know at least I, I can only speak for myself, but I know that in like, you know, in the back of my mind, like I'm going to get that opportunity at some point. And I'm in my 30s now, but I think that like, you know, like dreams like that don't exactly don't exactly go anywhere. So do you ever just wake up and think to yourself, holy shit, I'm a I'm a professional baseball player? <laughs> uh, sometimes, yes, sometimes no. I mean, it's it's, it's tough because you got to remind yourself that this is fun, you know, and, and when you could do that and, and it's hard, don't get me wrong. Sometimes, you know, it is hard. You know, you wake up, you do the same thing every day, but you, you kind of find ways to make it fun with the, the core group of guys that you have, you know, whether it's cracking jokes, uh, going to dinner or just goofing around the locker room. Um, but you find ways, find ways around it to, to not think about it. But there, there are some days where like, you make a phone call home and to a friend and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm in the office right now working. And then you're like, Oh wow. You know, like, I'm, I'm here and I'm just very grateful that I get the opportunity, you know, to pursue my dream as a professional baseball player. Cause I, not many people get to do it. And it's, it's an honor. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good way to look at it. You know, uh, Ed and I, we have normal, you know, nine to five type jobs, but we definitely wish that we could have been, you know, in a hotel on a Tuesday afternoon while our friends back home were at work or whatever. So I, I definitely see where you're coming from. And it is an honor that only a few people actually get to experience. That's why it's cool for us to get to talk to you guys and get to kind of live vicariously through you somewhat. Um, you mentioned cracking jokes and all that stuff with some of the guys who are kind of your best friends there on the team. Well, every, everyone pretty much throughout the year is, is a good friend of mine. I, there's no one that you really, that you don't hang out with and don't have a good time with. But there's, there's certain guys on teams that you just like, – sometimes in a meeting you just look to your right and they look at you and you just start bursting out in laughter, which is not not a good thing when you got a, a, an important meeting going on. But <laughs> there's that connection you will. But there's a guy, uh, Christian Christian Koss, um, Brian Van Bell. Um, oh, we had Van Bell on here. If, uh, he was our first, he was actually our first uh, our first guest. Well, well that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, he's a, he's another guy, Miami native. So I, I've been seeing him recently. We've been working out together. Um, the list goes on. There's so many, like I said, like with Brian Bayo, uh, Victor Santos, Mosqueda. So there's a whole bunch of guys that you just, you, you can mess around with and crack jokes with. Do you work with the other catchers at all? Uh, like when? Like, like during uh, the year? Because I, you hear a lot about like the pitchers work with the catchers, but do the catchers work with each other? I guess like uh, to yeah, their craft? always. Um, I know during the year we're, we're always we're getting work in, uh, whether it's early work or just in team fundamental. Um, we're always talking to each other in between innings. I'm um, in the dugout before the game, going over game plans. Hey, we like uh, we did this, this, and this to this hitter, and just try to follow the game plan and and do that. So we help each other on that on that end. But other than that, really, no. We just when we're at work, we're just having a good time, and when we're not at work, we're just we're just good friends, enjoying enjoying everyday life. How do you like Portland? I had a good how time. Liked, good. Uh, yeah. How have it you? Was, um, when you guys go out, like, what's like the what's like your favorite place to go out there? I didn't I didn't go out much there, but when I went to dinner to go out to, it was this place called Demelio's. You guys you guys heard of it? Is that the one that's on a boat? I feel like that sounds yes. familiar. Yes, it's that one. Shout out I was, to I, I, I've passed that, but I've never been to it. Shout out to them because they have the best lobster mac and cheese that I've ever had in my entire life. So shout out to them if they hear this. If they could send me some, that would be great. 
That was, <laughs> I, I I think that we've got to we've got to go reach out to them with that video clip. Uh, maybe we can get another one of you saying like I'm Eli Marrero of the Portland Seahawks. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll get you a commercial by the end of this episode. Oh man, that'd be awesome! You guys got to be in it with me then. <laughs> All the All lobster right, mac good. and cheese. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, yeah, you yeah. seem like you're a real seafood guy. I I love food in general. Food makes me happy, just like every everyone else. But uh, I have a uh, food. So a little a little fun fact about me: food is um, uh, it's another passion of mine. One day I want I want to open up a restaurant and and give back to the people. So oh, owning a, a restaurant and food is what makes and giving back to people food makes people happy and that's what i want to do what kind what of kind food of- would you want to serve uh, i can't give my secrets out man someone's gonna take it from me uh, i got okay. a whole bunch of stuff there and good ideas uh, we, we can talk outside of this if you guys want i'll let you know but but uh just just anything that's gonna make people just make people want to keep coming back you know um I live in Miami, so it's a lot of people open up a lot of good restaurants, a lot of trendy ones. So that's the kind of area I want to shoot for, but make it unique in my own way. Okay, well, let me ask you this then: you are you are on uh, you're on a hot date. She's coming over for the first time. You're cooking. What are you going to make her? Ooh, my go to my go to all the time is steak. I can make a mean steak with with my eyes closed. But uh, lately, what I've been getting into is is um, I get to get like a glass little plate. Um, I cut up some pineapples and some cubes, and I lay them on the bottom. And then I butterfly these chicken thighs, and then I put them on top of the pineapple and cook them in the oven for about 20, 25 minutes. Oh, my God. That sounds so good. <laughs> uh, you just put like this uh, this buffalo dry rub seasoning on top. So you, when, there, when it comes out of the oven, you get that, that – all the juices fall down into the pineapple. And you just pick off the chicken from the top, and you get like that sweet and spicy. It's so good. That's so that yeah. I can good. understand why you don't want to give away your secrets because that, that does sound <laughs> really good. your head. That just sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, there's one right there, so you guys can have that one. <laughs> that, we should just that, put together and, a cookbook at the end of uh, the season yeah. with all like uh, we just ask for every player's meal, and like ninety percent of them are, are grilled cheese, and then we've got this one. <laughs> yeah, this and lobster mac and cheese. Especially the lobster mac and cheese. D'Amelio's, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hunt you down. The lobster mac and cheese, the best ever. So besides uh, besides cooking and baseball, what do you uh, what do you get into during the offseason? Uh, I get into a little fishing from time to time whenever me and my friends have some time. Um, I, I'm into shoes a lot, so I like to collect some shoes. That's something I really like. I like to dress nice, so and kind of into the fashion world. Not too crazy. You know, I'm not that out there, but I like to be out there a little bit. Yeah, I um, you don't see a lot of like with baseball players a lot of like like you don't see like the Air Jordans or anything like that. Is that um, is that something that you ever talk about with like uh, your teammates? Like, why isn't there more like cleat lines or anything? I know some guys. I, I've seen a lot of guys that get custom cleats, don't don't they? You have some guys in the the big league level, right? That have some some Jordans that they customize them. A Doogie has a new pair of pretty much every game. Yeah, he he's got he's got drip, man, for real. That guy's got some. Cle- and you know, another guy that's got that rocks Jordans is Mookie. Yeah, he always had custom custom Jordans. Yeah, the thing, got- the thing with um, with Mookie that like is kind of wild to me also is the bat that he uses, like the axe. Uh, yeah, the, oh, yeah, the, the axe bat. bat. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I think we had a couple guys this year use it. I don't remember who. I think Northcutt might have used it. And ask a couple times. I'm not really sure who else used it. Have you ever tried one? I have, yeah. Uh, actually, Will Dalton gave me gave me one of his dovetail ones, and I used it for a little bit, and I was and I was swinging pretty good, and then I broke it, and then I was like, oh man. But uh, it's it's pretty cool to use. I mean, it, it feels a little bit different. You just your bottom hand just doesn't slide off slide off the knob, you know. And I'm I'm known a couple times, you know, to let let one rip into five uh five rows deep into the uh into the stand sometimes but uh the axe pad didn't let me do that so that was cool well um what are you getting into this off season have you been like um have you just been going working out with people are you playing in any uh are you going to be playing in any um like winter leagues uh no right now i'm just i've just been working out um just 
fixing, uh, making some adjustments that I got, that I, some personal adjustments that I want to make uh, to improve my game. Um, but no, nothing crazy. Just going to, fo just focusing right now on myself and, and some other things and, and just getting ready for, for spring training and uh, the next season. Are you, uh, is there anything, uh, are there any players that we should be keeping our eyes on that, uh, that, that you think are going to be uh, heading, uh, heading to, towards Fenway this year? I mean, there's one name in particular, right? And, that, and that's say Don Rafaela, right? <laughs> what uh, is what is it like getting to watch that guy play defense every day? Well, I get the I have the best view, you know, because I got him right in front of me. Um, it's sick. A ball goes up in the air in the outfield. Uh, if we got two outs, I just take my mask off and start running into the dugout because uh, <laughs> I know <he's, laughs> whether the ball's smoked or it's a little a little blooper. Uh, I know he's gonna make the play. Um, but yeah, he's just special to watch. I, I don't know how he does it. It's like he's got a magnet in his glove. Really, I'll be honest with you. It's it's insane. I've, I've seen that guy jump like a wall that's like seven feet tall. Uh, he did it against Binghamton. You know they have a big wall at their at their stadium. He he climbed all the way to the top, caught it, and it was just insane. It's and it's so refreshing it. to hear that. Uh, you know, I don't know how much you really watched the big league team <laughs> this past year, but there was a lot of uh, a lot of instances where fly balls were dropped by outfielders, and not not trying to dime anybody out, but it's so refreshing to hear that there is somebody like Rafaela on his way up that's going to be a completely a revolutionary type player in the outfield who's going to make all of this poor play worth it. Well, he takes a lot of pride in his defense. Good. So we're we're taking BP, and he's one of the uh, he's shagging balls. One of the guys do this, but he takes a lot of pride in his BP shagging. And there's balls mm -hmm. that get hit over the fence that he goes and robs during batting practice. So it's no surprise to me when he does it in the game, which is still sick to watch in person. But it's no surprise because he's there power shagging pretty much two hours before the game, getting his work in. So when it happens during the game, it's just kind of like most, that muscle memory we talked about. And it's again, it's sick. Again, two outs, balls hitting the smoke in the gap. If it doesn't hit the ground right over the shortstop's head and it's in the air for four seconds, that ball's caught every time. And I'm, Whenever I see it go up in the air and it's hit the center field, no matter what, how hard it is, again, I'm, my mask is off. I'm running in the dugout and I'm, I'm shaking hands. It's that ball's in the glove. You know, somebody else that used to do that, even at the big league level, was Jackie Bradley Jr. And that that's probably a, a fair comparison defensively to somebody like Rafaela is J Jackie Bradley Jr., a, a major league gold glove center fielder. Yeah. You. It's hard to compare with someone who does it at the at the the highest level there is, but I'm sure you're going to be seeing a lot of a lot of top ten plays out of him when he when he gets his chance up there. Probably he'll probably make one every night if they hit him out there. To be honest with you, he's made so many this year I've lost count. Yeah, uh, no, I remember come uh, come September we were seeing some highlights from him and it was like, yeah. oh wow, another diving play. <laughs> Do something else. Yeah, there, it's kind of like routine at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, and he made, but he makes it look easy. Also, some of the reads he gets are just so it's just so impressive. And also, I mean, we're talking about him in the outfield, but he can do it at shortstop too. Like I've seen yeah. him make some. He made that like over the shoulder, barehanded grab. It's um, at shortstop last year. He made like the play of the year for the team in left field, where he made that diving grab and then threw the guy out at first base. I mean, he's yeah. he's he's, he's, wherever, he's really a special athlete. Wherever, wherever you put that guy. He, he could put him to play catcher probably and he'll do good. You know, he'll probably pull something out of the magic hat. He's probably never caught before, but he'll probably put his hand in the magic hat and do, do something special there as well. So, I mean, he's just a special ball player all the way around. And it's fun. To, it's fun to be able to watch guys like that, you know, cause not too many guys, you don't get to see too many guys like that. Very special players like that. Yeah, I mean, so going, going full circle, um, did you get to, uh, the to, because at the beginning I was asking about uh, catching a no hitter. Did you get to work with Christian Vasquez at all? Um, during spring training, I got I got the opportunity to be around him for a little bit um, before games. Watched him go about his business. Watch him work with uh, Veritech. I got got to watch him do his pregame, and he's an awesome dude. Um, 
just to be around. He's a true professional, and the way he goes about his business, he enjoys the game, and he has fun with it. You know, he's been doing it for so long already, right? And he just enjoys it, and that's what makes it fun. To watch those guys at the highest level just to go about their day and, and have fun with it, that just goes to show you that th this game is not as hard as we make it. You just need to have fun, you know? Guys, you just get paid a little bit more to do it at the highest level, but, uh, but it's fun. It's fun to – to be able to learn and, and hear those guys talk. You know, you listen when, when you get those kind of guys in the room who have done it for a long time, especially World Series champions who have been around great teams. You just you just sit there and you listen to those guys speak because everything they say has good meaning to it. Is there anything that you think about that um, a player told you that you go back to and um, it has been has been helpful for you in your uh, career? Like any uh, like what what's like the first thing that uh, comes to your head? Um, I think it might have been who told me this. Who was it again? I can't think of it right now. I I know someone told me something one time. I don't want to I don't want to say the wrong name and then and then him shoot me a text, you know, and then be like, hey, what the heck? I I can't think of it off the tip of my tongue. It'll come back to me. But uh, what was the advice? I'm trying. I'm even trying to remember what he said. He says. He says every day that you come out here, are you doing are you doing everything you can? To win the day. That, that's all. He, that's all. That's all he would say. That's all he said. I can't remember who said it. And Good it life like, advice. It is. It is. Are you doing everything you can to win the day today? And it just makes you think. Like, it, you can go every any other way about it, but when you whatever way you go about it is, is is however you want to go about it. You know. But uh, I would just I just took it into everyday life and 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 uh, and every day at the field and just say. When I when I go after the game and I put my head down that I do everything I could today, you know, to to be good or be great. Who do you have? Uh, we're tied two two in the World Series right now. Um, who do you have? Uh, Houston or um, or Philly? It's been it's been a what, hell of a World Series so far. I've been really enjoying it. Hey, I have no complaints with this World Series at all. They've been guys have been mashing on the plate. Pitch has been doing their thing. I thought. What uh, Javier did yesterday was special. And he's been doing good for the Astros, honestly. I think he did the same thing against the Yankees, right? He threw... Yeah, this was his second uh, the second no-hitter he was a part of this year. Yeah, and, and I don't know how that, how he's not one of their best pitches there. I think he's, well, their fifth, fourth or fifth starter, right? Well, you know, I mean, having Justin Verlander in your rotation yeah. is already <laughs> going to be something tough. And they've got um, Valdez and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, like I mean, both teams have just played so well in, in very different ways. No, it's, it's been fun to watch the Phillies what they what they could do. I mean, at the beginning of the year, I know they were kind of almost not written off, but they they weren't they weren't in the contention, right? Well, they, they, did, did, did they fire their manager, or am I misremembering that? I don't know. I, I don't. I feel like you might be right. I forget if it was because I know the Blue Jays did that, but. I think I, I think the Phillies might have also. I don't know it. Whatever they did there to change the culture and what they, what they're yeah. doing, they got to they got to. It, it was it was it was Joe Girardi to start yeah. the season, and they they fired him in June. Oh wow, that was before the that was before the All Star break, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. that was before they got yeah. hot. They started twenty two twenty two and twenty nine, and then they fired Girardi, and then since since then they've. Uh, Obviously, turned their season around quite a bit. Yeah, kind of like the Braves, uh, twenty twenty one managed to do the same thing. So maybe, maybe the next time people start panicking if uh, their team has a slow start, uh, just remind them that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you can't start that trend because a lot of managers are going to be be going crazy. Yeah, that's that's true. But think about the the new ones that get to come in and uh, they get their start in, the, in a season where they end up winning the. Winning the World Series, yeah, that's crazy. But um, the problem is, so, it's not winning it, right? It, it's it's after you win it, right? It comes with all that responsibility, right? All right, you gotta you gotta wake up the next year and you gotta do it all over again. Oh yeah, I mean the hangover is definitely real. Look at the uh, the 2019 Red Sox. Uh, definitely a lot of the same guys and just couldn't couldn't replace that magic. Yeah. So, but to answer, your, to answer your other question, I mean, I, I think the Phillies might do it. I mean, I know the it's going to go seven games, but I think the Phillies and just it's just uh, one of those magical seasons for them. 
and I, I could see them getting a job done. The key to the Phillies' victory is to keep Jordan Alvarez from from uh, driving in an RBI. This postseason, the Astros are undefeated in games when he has an RBI. Well, what? A, well, yeah, you could say that. But what about Kyle Tucker right now? That guy is unbelievable. Uh, he, he's he's been on fire too. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you could almost not forget about Jordan right now, but you got to shut that guy down. That guy's mashing. So is Alex Bregman. They're mashing at but they, they have such a deep lineup. It's hard to pitch you. It's they one really of those, do. It's one of those when you're back there calling a game and you got Jose Altuve and then you got Jeremy Pena, Jordan, Bregman, and then the list goes on and on. And you're like, oh my God. Every pitch you gotta be locked in. Because you make one mistake, you, you got a guy on base. The guy just hit a two run home run and you're down 2 0. So I mean when you got when there's a deep lineup like that, it's special to watch. Got to be scary as a pitcher, though. <laughs> <laughs> you're, telling, you're telling me I, when I'm back there, guys come up to the play. I'm like, oh man, this situation. Holy cow. We got men on first. If we just got one of their best hitters out, now we got an even better hitter coming up to the play. You're like, dang. But uh, it's got to be fun, though. And the more you, the more, the higher you rise through the minors, the better the hitters are going to be. You know, you get to AAA, there are going to be guys who have been in the show and who have been there for for a few years and you know it's uh, it's really just a holding tank at this point so that's got to be i mean that's you're so close to that right now that must be so exciting it's awesome it's, it's awesome again after after the first the nerves really go away after the first inning you know so you get super excited you're kind of nervous oh man you got this guy this guy this guy in the lineup today just like when we had i think we had a couple guys rehab with us we had christian royal rehab uh with us a couple times uh ref snyder kike yeah, Story was there too, I think. Yeah, and Story. I'm sure the other guys on the other team at one point were like, oh, man, they, they basically have a major league team in, in, uh, in double-A Portland, you know? <laughs> one point in time, I think we had, uh, we had Kike, uh, Trevor, and Ref Snyder, I think almost all in the same lineup. If not, I think one of those guys didn't play. But it's like, got one, two, and three, those guys in the lineup. I think we played, who was it? Hartford, I think at home one more time. I think we had Ref Snyder and Kike. Ref Snyder's first pitch, he hits it over the, he hits it out straight away center field. And I'm like, oh wow, it's gonna be a fun day. And the next at that, he comes up and hits it over the monster and left field. And I'm like, oh wow, <laughs> we're sitting on like a, I think it was like four zero cushion, and we're like, oh wow. How much do you guys like when there's a guy rehabbing on the team from the majors? How much is he kept separate from the 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 team there, the double A team? And how much yeah. are they one of the guys? Not, not as much as you would think. They're actually pretty invested. To be real with you guys, that's um, good to hear. Yeah, they're not, they're not, they're not in their own locker room. No, they're in their clubhouse with us. They're, they're having a good time. Obviously, they got their own routines that they gotta do, you know. But uh, they do team fundamental with us, except for the pitchers. The pitchers, I remember we had uh, Chris Sale, Waka, and um, and Rich Hill. They they don't come out for team fundamentals. They, they kind of do their own thing. They get ready to pitch for the game. But when we had Trevor Story, Kike, and Ref Snyder, they're out there for team fundamentals, going through the same kind of routine as we would in uh, taking BP on the field. Uh, but, it, it, again, it's good to have those guys in the clubhouse because you get to see how they go about their business. It's the same way. It's the same game pretty much, you know, just a little bit smoother the higher you go up. And they just have so much fun with it. It's the craziest thing. You know, they act like we, when you're at the minor league level coming up, you're almost – you kind of treat it like ser super serious, and then you watch those guys come in the clubhouse, and they are laughing all the time with each other, making jokes, and you realize that this game is just based off little kids at heart. We're adults, but we're little kids at heart, at heart just playing the game at the highest level. Yeah, there's something something very pure about that. Yeah. So my um. My last question, and if uh, Brandon, if you have any after me, please go right ahead. But uh, do you have any pets? That's a, that's a great question. I do. I have four pets right now. Um, we did have five. Unfortunately, he he, uh, he passed. He, the, our other pet, we had a pet bird. He passed away a couple of days ago. So I'm sorry. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so I have three dogs, and then I have an interesting pet. I'll let you guys guess what my other pet is. Make it more fun. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna go totally random and say uh, a chinchilla. Okay. What about you, Brandon? Um, South Florida iguana. See, both of you literally just over 
especially you, Brandon, you're just overthinking it too much. I got a, I got a, I got a pet pig in the backyard. Oh my pet god! Pig. I yeah. am. So- that is my like. I'm not even kidding you. Like that is. I would love to have a pet pig. That would be. I have a. I have a dog. But like, if we had the space for a pig, I would be all over that. Yeah. That now, is- what is the pig's name? Uh, we call her. We named her Missy, but in Spanish, okay. we, we, in Spanish, we call her Gordi or Gordita, which means like a little chunky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, she's awesome. I mean, Ed, you could you could honestly get her. I mean, when I got her, she was super small, kind of the size of a Yorkie. And right. the only reason she grew is because you're only supposed to feed them once a day. But I would sneak her snacks all the time inside the house, and so she started to get bigger and bigger. And yeah, that's she, like I, I'd have to convince my fiance to do that. We live in like a little one bedroom apartment right now. But as soon as we're out of here, I'm just gonna be the gonna crazy start part, lobbying that. The crazy part is that. I think when they're little and you house train them, they're litter trained. Wait, seriously? Seriously. So like the first two years we had her, she was litter trained. She would only go use the bathroom in whatever uh, the little tray that we put out for her. Just like a cat. It was the craziest thing. Oh and she lived and she would fall asleep inside the kennel. And then as she got bigger, my, my dad just kind of kicked her outside. And if you guys <laughs> if you guys see what she looks like now, she is huge. She's pushing about, I think, 100, 105 pounds. Oh, She's my big. God. Wow. She's huge. <laughs> I've heard that it's pigs are very affectionate. She is. She has her moments, you know. She she definitely has her moments. There's some days where she does not let you pet her. She does not want to be bothered. Then there's some days where she just doesn't leave you alone. And all you have to do is rub her belly, and she just kind of flops on the ground. Legs go up in the air, and you just oh. kind of rub her belly. It's it's the funniest thing ever. And the well, best part about it is, is honestly, she's a garbage disposal. You have fruit going bad, or you have anything going bad, just you just go out there, give it to her, and she will eat it, which is the craziest thing. It's, uh, I mean, that's one of for me. I, I hate wasting any kind of food, so that's actually I well, like, I need to be taking notes here so I could have like this all. I could have like a whole spiel prepared for uh, for my fiance. You gotta have a good PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with just like images, like I can borrow some pictures of Missy or something and be like, yeah, I'll definitely. I'll, I'll send some some cute videos over there uh, for you <laughs> to help you out. What are um, the the dog? What kind what kind of dogs do you have? Uh, so I have a, a Yorkie, a miniature pincher, and then a, a pit mix with Visla. Oh my god! I'm... So it's like kind of some little ones, and then like the pit mix. Yeah, he's not, he's not super huge. He's about a medium sized dog. He's probably about like 50 to 60 pounds. Nothing too crazy. But I'll give you another fun fact about us. Before before I, I got the, my other dog, um, all of our dogs had baseball names. Really? So what, what were the baseball names? So when I was younger, we had a boxer. We had two boxers, but we had one that was named, named Slam which is stands for Grand Slam. Right. And then we had another boxer that we named Steel. And like then the minute, base. Yeah. Then we had a Yorkie that we had – we also – I have so many dogs, I can't even remember. We had another Yorkie that we called Ribby. That's, I really, that's a really cute name, name for a dog. Yeah. My mom comes Especially up with – Especially a Yorkie. Mom comes up with all these. Is, I don't know how she does it. She's – but <laughs> – then she got another Yorkie, and she named – he's here with us right now. He's walking around. Uh, his name was Slider. Another and, then, name. and then the miniature pincher that everyone questions when I say the name, but we call him Cycle. Like you hear for the Cycle, right? Right. No, no that, prob- works. that works. But they I, probably hear Psycho. Yeah, instead. they're like, why do you <laughs> why do you name him Psycho? I'm like, what do you mean? They're like Cycle. They're like Psycho. Like he's crazy. I'm like, yeah, he's crazy, but no, his name's not Psycho. It's Psycho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we almost uh, we have the one that was here before. Uh, she's like a Chihuahua. Corgi, probably some other stuff, and we re- she was a rescue. But if we had gotten a boy, we were going to name them uh, Raffy. Um, oh, that's a good name. Yeah, no, because um, whatever. Um, my my fiance loves Raphael Devers, and every time um, he comes on, I'm like, look, it's Raffy, and we she really like fell in love with the idea of that. And then the only dogs that were available were girl dogs, and we didn't like Raffy for that. She's yeah. a penny anyway. She looks like a yeah. penny, so it worked out. What about you, but... Brandon? What do you what do you have? I have a bull terrier. She's uh 12 years old. She's she's getting up there. Dang. Yeah, my, my mom's jerky is 16. You believe he's he's still going? Wow. Oh my wow. God. Healthy as he could be, though. It's the craziest thing. Oh. He, he keeps up with the other dogs outside, which is crazy. 
The smaller dogs live longer. Yeah. That dog, that dog, special though. That that dog, uh, my mom had lost him. Crazy story. My mom lost him for seven years, and then some, some, I think some old lady uh, found him, or I guess he ran away from someone else who had him for the seven years that he was missing, and uh, she took him to the vet, and they sent her a picture of the dog, and hey, we have your dog here because I guess he was microchipped. Wow. Oh, God. Yeah. And uh, he came back. It's one of those crazy stories. I mean, that's how like, how did how was your mom when she found that out? Because I mean, seven. It's like it's almost like uh, you know, it's almost like meeting a ghost. It's almost it's, it's one of those kind of like those fiction stories, right? Those made up yeah. stories that you read in books, almost right. Um, at first, she kind of took it in as like, oh my god, like you know, stop playing around with me, like because she didn't get another dog after that. She was kind of up, super upset that that she lost the dog, but, um, she was like, don't play around with me. This is for real. And no, and they sent her a picture of the dog. Uh, he didn't look like what he looks like now. He was like, he looked like a mop. Literally. He had hair, like he was all over the place, but she found him and brought him. And it was the, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen to be honest with you guys. I mean, it's unbelievable. You only hear about that in books and to see that in, in real life was crazy. No, I'm getting I'm getting teary eyed just thinking about about <laughs> that right now. That's 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 thing. amazing. Yeah, so that I, is he, amazing. He he probably he means something special. I mean, he doesn't leave my mom's side now, so he was probably he's probably heartbroken himself. The dog was probably heartbroken himself that hey, why'd you leave me for seven years? You know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, like sure. But, I mean, just to getting that back though. I mean, did he remember her? Right away. He must have, right? He didn't so the crazy part is he didn't change at all. So like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was this thing that my dad used to do with the dog. He would get close to my mom and kind of just like jump at her just to mess around. And he would bark at him like and to see if he was a real dog. He did the same thing and the dog never changed. He was the same exact dog from when he left to when he got back. It's like almost like that's it never, incredible. Seven years never happened. Yeah, basically. It's crazy. That's that that is that is like legitimately one of the most amazing things I've ever heard on one of these. <laughs> Insane. Insane. That's awesome. I think that's a perfect spot to end this episode because I don't think anything we can come up with would top that. Yeah. I mean, wow. Um, before before we head out, though, um, what where can people follow you? Uh, any, fa any fans want to follow what you're up to? I mean, you, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm, I'm pretty active there and Twitter as well. Uh, Eli underscore Morero 10. And on Twitter, Eli underscore Moreau nine. Uh, you can follow me there. It's I'm pretty active there. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much uh, for coming on. It was really, really fun meeting you. And, no, thank uh, you guys for having me on. And this is for my first podcast. This was, this was awesome. I had a great time. Thank you guys. Oh, uh, we, we, you know, they don't all go this well. So we're, uh, we're pretty, uh, you know, if, 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 your, if you couldn't tell us this was your first time, we'd have had no idea. Yeah, you're a natural at it. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Hey, remember, man, the Milios, the best lobster mac and cheese you've ever had. All right? Eli said that. <laughs>